welcome to a new Harry's Garage video and this is the start of a road trip. We're off to Spain and I've always wanted to do a bit more in Spain because the roads are just fantastic out there and we're going to be taking the Porsche 930, this Turbo S. I first introduced this in the garage just before Christmas. Super excited. I'm still very excited about this car trying to find out a bit more about its history because obviously this was one from the Sonderwunsch department at Porsche, the special wishes. So it's enhanced in quite a number of ways, as I've explained, but I, some of the extra detail I found out, 3.4 litre engine, 400 horsepower, etc. We're going off to Spain. We have a ferry to catch in about, well, about four hours time from Portsmouth. So I'm gonna take the ferry down to Bilbao. Now I've done this before. We did it actually in the Testarossa when we went off to Morocco, and I've done bike trips out in Spain as well two-day crossing and I don't know if you can hear but it is absolutely blowing a hoolie outside so we'll see what the cross is like when we get there but yeah if you come over here I'll show you where we're going to go now I've had this map out on a table at home because I do like a paper map I know it seems to amuse some of you who thinks everything is just by Google these days, but a map tells you so much more, and especially where you can study it. So we have it open on the table the last few days, and we mark routes in. So we will come into Bilbao, right up the top here. There's something else in Bilbao happening. It opened a few days ago. There was an exhibition there of some pretty spectacular automobile and how it fits in with design and architecture being put together by Norman Foster. And there's some spectacular cars there. Nick Mason's 250 GTO is there. There's a Bugatti Atlantic 57 there as well. Some, so some very special cars. So we want to go to there, but we're going to land at Bilbao. I think we're going to do the exhibition on the way back. So the first day we're going to charge down this basically is dotted line and come down the motorway because where we're actually heading is this Ubida here. It looks a wonderful um, place. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Town and a lovely hotel there. And key to it, it's got private parking. So that's sort of why I've chosen here because then you're in the epicenter of this area, which I've sort of done some of these roads on car launch and things. Um, so we, and then we'll head back over a few days. We're only there for uh, four to five days. And then we'll be catching a ferry back to the UK. So that's the plan. And if you're wondering why we're not driving down sort of, you know, Calais and charge across France, it's to do this bit, to get down to Nesca there, is around 450 miles. If I drove from here to there, it's about 1400 miles. So it takes about 15 hours of driving out. And yeah, I quite like going on the ferry because you just land where your destination is. 8 a.m. in the morning, we come out of the ferry and you just get on and it's lovely weather down there looking at it. So yeah, what we're gonna do now, I'll pack all this up, go pack the car and uh, yeah, we'll charge off, catch a ferry. Well, morning, we are just leaving the ferry, literally just cop down. I'm not quite sure why there's an alarm going on. Um, yeah, so I think the last time you saw us, we're in the garage, so quite a lot has happened since then. Easy run down to Portsmouth and then joined a mighty queue to get on the ferry. I have to say it's not particularly um, classic friendly because you are ticking over and moving inching forward for about an hour and a half to get on the Bilbao ferry. We're literally just exiting the ferry. So this is the ramp, which isn't too bad actually. It's quite an aggressive sort of that. Right, so that's the end of the ferry. You always go at a diagonal, but I'm sure you all know that one, that trick. Yeah, the crossing itself, um, I've done seven crossings now. Uh, this Bilbao or Santander to Portsmouth, and two of them have been properly rough. But when you go across the Bay of Biscay, you've got the full Atlantic sort of fetch coming at you and it was rough enough as we went across that everything had gone, kitchens were getting destroyed, you could hear pandemonium kitchens, and you just couldn't keep anything on the table. It was pretty deserted, the boat itself. Um, but anyway, that's part of it, I'm afraid. It's just the Bay of Biscay is well renowned for being a bit rough. So far with the car, well, I'm surprised how many bags we got in the front nose. That was good. Obviously, squashed, squashy bags, not fixed uh, cases or anything. But I think it's three or four 
bags in there. I'm surprised also at how quickly the fuel gauge seems to be going down. Um, I think it, I think the MPG isn't going to be spectacularly good on this car. We'll wait and see, but uh, this trip will find that out. But the weather, well, after the it was rain and a very strong wind. I have a live wind map on my phone and it predicts the wind. It's the first time I'd seen purple sector as we went across the Bay of Biscay. They were talking about a 90 to 100 kilometer an hour wind. So yeah, very windy out there. But here, sun's just coming up. It's about 11 degrees outside. Um, so anyway, first of all, passport control. That was quite fun, we've just filled up with fuel, so I'll discuss in a moment. What got me, just come over the top, so we came out of Bilbao, actually I'll show you on the map on here. We've come out of Bilbao, you, you, it's a motorway, it's a flowing motorway, it's quite confusing in places and you've got to watch the speed limits and there's cameras and things and knots. And what we were trying to do was get to Lugarano here. And then we take this road. And it's always worth, I think, getting a Michelin map because they always mark the scenic roads with green beside them. So you can see this is green. And we've just done that. It's sort of through a gorge. The traffic empties we went up and there's these vast vistas as you go at the top. Oh, there's a tunnel there. That surprised me. I don't know what height that is, but there was snow all on this bit up here, just on the top ridge. We didn't actually, we just saw a bit of snow as we came out the tunnel there, just side of the road, and then there's a big vista, and someone tried to run into me there for some reason. He wasn't paying attention at all. Something in Spain, if you do come this way, it's April the 9th, and you forget how high this sort of bit is. I say there's snow, and there's salt on the road. If you look down the side of the car, you can see all the salt I've picked up. So all the roads are salted, even though it's the 9th of April and our, our mentality of the Brits think, oh, it's bound to be warm. We've gone all the way south. So it will be warm in a moment. Or so. I've had a suspicion this car uses a lot of fuel and it's just been borne out. I've just filled it up. I haven't actually worked out the last bit. I've put 57.28 litres in it that works out at 12.6 gallons. And for those 12.6 gallons, we've done 261 kilometers, which is a bit of a shock. So let's work that out. 261 divided by 12.6 equals 20.7 kilometers to the gallon. Of 13 MPG is what this car does on a motorway. Yeah, I suppose that performance has to come from somewhere but I'm pretty shocked at that and I hope that's a miscalculation. We'll find out on the next fill-up. I think even the Espada would do better and I've had the Testarossa out here and that was about 20, 21 MPG at motorway speeds. But no, 12, 13 MPG, yikes. That was most amazing morning. I can't believe it's uh, five to one. And what a morning that's been. Sun's out and the road, if I just show you what we just done. Last time we were just filling up and I was in a state of shock because of the MPG at Soria. Did a little bit of their uh, motorway down and they decided to turn off. And it's gonna be disastrous pronunciation from now on. Almazan, shall we say? And you come down here and you think you're lost. And we were following to there, Atenzia, and then came down to Quenza. And that is where we're having a coffee there. That road, empty, 
the the vistas huge space you feel like you're in a western movie at one point the vultures came down and saw them on the road there was someone who'd hit a rabbit and they were after it two or three and then some circling up ahead but just it was the space empty road past a tractor or two and that was about it except for one local and I was going slightly quicker than the speed limit and he was very uh, frustrated and then disappeared off and um, yes I'm thinking quite a high speed should we say but uh, I, I don't I don't care what the rest of the day brings I just love the way if you do take that ferry yes it's a pain yes it's two days but it dumps you straight into the action at the top of Spain and I've done other bike trips uh, along the sort of coastline Northern coast much the roads are busy up there but we're up in the hills and stuff but as, as I said earlier it's always a shock at how high it is as you come away from the coast and you're heading south but what we're going to do now I'm now going to go back onto their motorway Madrid and head down to the hotel something I've ought to just add what I've discovered about the car it's it's a very comfy car it's long geared I'm quite often having second gear for some of the sort of more nadry routes third and fourth fifth is a rare occasion taking fifth you you need to be about over 80 mile an hour on this thing to make it actually work I have a suspicion that MPG is correct it's going to be always in the very low figures and hopefully in the teens I'd like to say brakes uh, the power the sheer power of this car the the brakes are exposed as a bit of a weak link they need it's going in for a service I need new discs on the front they're not going to survive this trip they're already trimmering away but yeah comfy easy 911s they always sort of easy and sunroof works a treat so as I say I'm a very happy boy and it's one o'clock on the first day in Spain long may it continue getting closer to the hotel now I think we're only about 45 kilometers away we've went down to Madrid on the motorways very industrial really quite busy for a Spanish motorway but highest speed average and uh, we've just turned off on the E301 and sort of cut the corner to go into Iboga and I'm really quite liking it because it's warmer down here staring at a outside temperature gauge oh, 75 degrees I think that's saying so it's on the way to 80 degrees which is nice now on the motorway I actually filled up again and this time we did about 270 kilometers before needing a fill and I put a bit more fuel in it and um, yes this average of 13 mpg I'm I'm gobsmacked. I, I never thought this would drink more fuel than my Rolls Royce Silver Shadow or something like that. Yes, it's got a lot of horsepower, but I have not used full throttle yet on this journey. But uh, yeah, this car is a guzzler, shall we say, as you used to say in the States. But what I'm going to do now, I'm going to enjoy this road, lovely scenery outside, open the roof, and make our way to Ubida, the hotel stop for tonight. Well, morning from Ubida. This is this town here, this Nesco site that we stayed in last night, and I think it was spectacular. I'm lucky enough to visit an awful lot of places around the world and there's some exceptional sights at this place no wonder it's a UNESCO site and then you've got the setting look at it it's this vastness and then the other bit I can't get over this place is it was about seven eight hours from the ferry and you're in a completely different zone it's quite a popular place at weekends we're told and also this is Easter so the hotel was quite full actually last night but it has a buzzy atmosphere now I stayed in the hotel where we stayed in just because it had private parking. One thing that's really tricky in all these amazing medieval sort of towns and cities in this area, parking is at a premium. 
and we paid a premium, 28 euros, to have un, uh, private secure parking, which turned out to be underneath the hotel in a lift. And I had a lift up and down. We've just uh, come up from the lift now. Um, but a lovely hotel, a bit, a bit poncy for me, really. Got a beautiful setting and then this glorious sort of area in the middle of it that uh, you, you know, you have drinks and it's cool and shaded because it is warm. Um, we got up to 80 degrees yesterday and it's forecast to be a bit warmer today. But yeah, all working very well at the moment. And then you've got the amazing roads here. And this is the area of olive oil in Spain. All these uh, olive groves, we drove through miles of them on the approach to here. And it's, it just reminds me of Italy, really. But it's that much closer to the UK if you take that ferry. But we're going to go further into here. I can see snow-topped mountains right in the distance there. There's still snow around in this area and you forget how high it is. But there are some glorious roads out that way. I'll show you actually on a map where we're going. This is the area we're in down here. Ibiza is here. Cordoba we nearly chose but parking was an issue there. Granada is pretty, I mean it's a bigger place and still parking is tricky but Ubida is where we chose. And then this is the Sierra Segura, is this area here. There's some lakes at the top. End destination tonight is Alicon up there, 14th century castle. We're actually going to use a Parador hotel um, tonight. Anyway, I'm going to get going because we've got quite a long way to go and a quite a spectacular place to go and visit. Look at it. Mrs M has just told me we've got 68 kilometers of this. She's overjoyed. There's some serious airplanes coming up. My favorite. Making our way up through this Sierra de Segura. This road is really quite tight on the way up here. We sort of cope, I can't say it's a particularly good driving road, but the views, if you come over here, are spectacular. Look at that. We're at about 1200 meters up here. Well, there you go, that's, that's what it's like down there. As I say, it's just wall to wall olive growth. I've just never seen an area like it. I say in Italy, they sort of have odd patches of olives and then you have another crop or something and it's, and it's quite populated. They have the houses in amongst it, not here. Blanket olive groves. But if you look at the other side where the car is, just a spectacular view. It's all rocks and there's nothing growing. It's very wild. And that's where we're heading now. There's another 60 kilometers of this road. And then we're gonna turn onto a bigger main road. summary of what happened today. Once we got up into that national park it, it was a bit tedious to be truthful. Very beautiful and empty thank goodness because there's no overtaking really on those little roads. But it went on and on and on. I didn't I didn't like there was no escape from it really. Um, so yeah I can't recommend it fully as a place to visit. But it's very beautiful and I'll probably go on a bike or I'll go hiking or go on a mountain bike or something like that. Okay. 
place. Welcome to day three of our travels in Spain. This is the most extraordinary hotel and hotel room. And I thought I'd just do the intro of what we're gonna to do today from here. This is this little sitting area in the room we've got. If you come on up here, you'll see that in this little cubby, I look down from the tower of this place, if I grab the camera, you can see there's the car hiding in the car park down there. I just, I just thought it was an ideal opportunity, it's quite windy outside and I'll show you what we're going to do today and just a quick recap of what we did yesterday. So Ubeda, that's where we set off from yesterday and then we went up into this um, Sierra de Seguga area and this windy, quite slow route up here, very, very beautiful. And then we then dashed up, we used the main road, this D322 up to this place filled up and then we just went cross country and this is the randomness with this area of Spain. This is the most extraordinary road, fast, sweeping, made our way up here and we stayed in Alacon. So this is a parador of Alacon and uh, the only one here that sort of, I don't know what age this is. I mean, it's, it's old obviously, but it has been rebuilt. But we went up on the parapets yesterday and the views and this gorge that sort of rings this tower, this hotel. I mean, exquisite views, quite breathtaking really, and the approach, etc. And that's what you get with these paradors. They're always in these historic buildings and there's a surprise factor to them. But this one in particular, we had a fantastic meal last night. It's really good. And they had an English menu, so it was easier to choose, etc. It's quite expensive staying here. I think it's about 300 euros for the night for this room. I think there are cheaper rooms, but this one, top of the tower. So today, I can quickly find where we are. So we are there, and we are making our way up in the end to Sequenza. So we're staying in another parallel there, historic building, but we're just going to explore this area. Uh, of Spain. So we're to the uh, east of Madrid. Uh, we'll go into more detail when when we're there. But what I'm fast discovering when you do go to Spain and do a tour in holiday like this, there are no bad roads. It's like Italy, but emptier and just terrific roads, well surfaced, great sights, and yeah, real good place to exercise the car. So the car. Yeah, it's, we had another fill up last night and it was the lowest of the lot, 11.7 mpg on the last fill up. Anyway, going to pack up bags, get out there, go and see what today brings. Just one of the peculiarities of the air-cooled Porsche at 930 like this is how you do top up the oil, etc. And I can see from here the pressure is fine, temperature is fine, but you leave it ticking over once it's warm and the oil, um, this is the oil level, and it should move a bit into the white, and it's not moving into the white, so I'm just going to top it up, I think. But you can't top it right full apparently because then it, it spills out so it's this weird balance but there is a dipstick but i've got to turn the engine off and quickly go and do the dipstick because it will drain out of the tank you measure it from all very peculiar all very 911. right oil oil highs around here if you can see that that's where it is absolutely impossible to try and put oil in but there is a dipstick there's the dipstick and there we are just i think it's just at the bottom yeah so it's it's above minimum but i want it up a bit so i'm going to buy some oil i have oil but they don't have a funnel and it is just impossible to, to get it there without spilling it everywhere. I'm not gonna do it now. I know it's above minimum, but I have some oil. Now I just need a funnel. 
Yeah, I've just stopped again to try and find a funnel and filled up with fuel. No go, so I'm going to have to invent my own funnel, a water bottle. So I'm going to cut the cut the top off. I'm actually going to make it relatively long. out of it because you don't really want to be adding water to your engine. I think that's about as good as it's going to get. Dipstick out, you can see it's just on the that mark. Shove that in there. Right, I probably only want about half a litre in this. Perfect. Yeah, it's 500. Good. Quite pleased with that. Following this CM2106, this road that goes through a sort of national park, we're right up. It's all these escarpments and sort of limestone escarpments. It's just vast, this area. I can't get over it, but we stopped for lunch, a lovely little place just en route. Can't, sorry, I can't tell you where it was, but it, 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 I can't get over how this road just continues. It's, it, doesn't have a sort of crescendo, you know, it's not a pass like you're, when you're in the Alps, you're going over the top. It's just beautifully um, prepared roads, and they're really good roads. And every now and then there's sort of a knot of bends, and then it opens out, and then there's another little knot, and the scenery remains fantastic all the way. Just a slightly steeper bit here, so yeah, 13%. It's quite steep actually, it's so about one in eight, isn't it, in UK speak. There's also a bit of a magic moment. I'm just seeing that we're almost at a thousand kilometres for this trip. We're at yeah, 995 at the moment. Just dropping down into this valley, I think. There's no habitation, there's no agriculture going on up here. It's just wilderness. It's bizarre. I say we're not that far from Madrid. To the east of Madrid, but we just don't get roads like this in the UK, especially not that go on well, well over 100 kilometres. Must be this road since we've been on it. And I think we've got another 50 or 60 kilometres, about 83 kilometres to go. Uh, what's this? Is this the river at the bottom? Looks like it. Yeah, there is. Yeah, a little river. Different Provence, vultures up the top, circulating, waiting for me to put it in the wall and have some lunch. That's where we are parked, that's where I'll also take on. I'm trying to think when the last time I saw a car, I think one went past us about I can remember two bikes about 10 minutes ago, but a car, I can't remember the last time we saw a car. That's how deserted it is. What a day it's been, and it's not over yet. Yeah, this now, we've lost all the trees now, by the little things. It's so strange, this area. Just the variety. Strong. 
straight roads. Oh, look out, here we go. There's a thousand kilometers just coming on. There we are. So we're one, 1,000 kilometers into this trip. So 620 miles. Yeah, anyway. I'm gonna carry on. Otherwise I'm gonna say, look at this amazing deserted roads for the next two or three hours, which will be very boring. But um, yeah, I'll catch up with you again, probably in the morning just see the final bit of this journey is there's a desert region I've always wanted to visit and we're going to have a look at that tomorrow From Sequenza, we are stayed at this another one of these paradors, one of these historic buildings that the government have helped support the sort of restoration and the rebuilding of, and they turn them into these sort of hotels to stay in. It's quite big, this one. If you look up, <laughs> it's an enormous great fort. We had a great room that had a sort of balcony sort of over the inner courtyard and have dinner here as well. But the, yeah, the car park is a bit tricky. It's just this area in here, this sort of enc enclosed area and cobbles and a bit rough and stuff. But anyway, yesterday, what a day that was, again. Uh, I think you left us, we were just in the woods and I said, yeah, we've got another two hours to get to the hotel. As expected, after that twisty tight section, suddenly the road opened up and it was flowing and fast and just glorious really and the sun came out another day up in the high 70s high 20s 25 26 degrees or something yeah like a summer day just one other thing we, we, we arrived here last night and just went wandered into town and then there was sort of weirdness going on at the churches everybody's running around there was obviously going to be some sort of procession so we thought, oh, we hung back and see what this is all about. And they really do celebrate Easter. So today's Tuesday and it's Good Friday is this week, Friday. But they are already sort of celebrating the uh, beginning of the Easter period. And this bizarre procession started. First of all, it was all these guys with yeah, strange hats and just little eyelets out. I could refer to a sort of gang in America that you're not allowed to mention, but uh, it's just a very odd look. And then these guys did this weird shuffle with carrying these figurines through the streets. There was a band playing, everyone was out. And it was actually great to see just how popular this was and how they celebrate as a town um, Easter, the approach to Easter. So anyway, enjoyed that one. Um, yeah, what we're going to do today, it's our sort of last full day in Spain. And there's one more area I wanted to visit. It's almost the trigger what made me want to come for Spain on this trip because there is this region that almost looks like Arizona, this sort of desert, peculiar landscape. And it's the Sunday Times did an article on five hidden gems of Spain. And it was in there and that's where we're going to end up today so i'm going to show you a bit of spain that i've never visited before that has most extraordinary landscape so better get going the sun's actually out we had a great big thunderstorm last night if you look at the car yeah it's it's had a little wash um it's quite wet there's a bird deposited some some deposit on the bonnet which is winding me up but um yeah need to fuel up and we've got about sort of two and a half hours to get to this desert region and well, i'm sure the roads are, are going to be terrific anyway so yeah go fill up get going this is where we're heading this park natural this completely different sort of landscape moonscape almost i'm hopeful yeah you can just see the start of it over there but yeah after leaving that parador you know, we had more rain went over the top big open roads didn't really matter and then it just got quite industrial as we headed further east I really don't know what to expect from this it's a vast area aren't that many roads within it so I'm not quite sure is this it we go down here so 
already. We're making this up as we go along, as you can tell. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. It looks almost as though it's been quarried. And they're all over the distance, I can see it. It's, it's very like Morocco. Centre of information, four and a half kilometres, I suppose. Well, we've just been over to the visitor centre over there and a very helpful young lady gave me this map and also gave the slightly bad news that the route to actually see this this blank bar, this area I wanted to see lunar landscape is has this green ringed road around it and it's a gravel road and I don't really I'm I'm being all a bit poncy and I don't want to take my lovely Porsche um, Turbo S down a gravel road of 34 kilometres that takes two, three hours to navigate. Well, this is where I wanted to see in Spain during this trip. This, this incredible national park in this hidden corner of Spain that I really didn't know existed until reading that Sunday Times report. But unfortunately, as you, you know, I've already explained, there's this Via Blanca, as I would term it, this gravel road that's 34 kilometers long. And much as I enjoyed taking the Testarossa to the Sahara, it did it no good at all. We spent about a year getting all the dust out of every, all the joints and around the engine, etc. So I'm not prepared to do it on this car. But even here, it's pretty spectacular. Just to see that formation. I guess it's a sort of a harder rock at the top with a softer clay underneath and that's why you get these weird formations the sort of the iconic picture everyone does in this park is a few kilometers down that way but i'll put one up now so you can sort of see the majesty of this park but if you're here in a higher car it would be absolutely perfect to see this park in or something else that you really don't mind getting particularly dusty I suggest it might well be worth sort of disappearing for a couple of hours and 34 kilometres and do a loop of it and see this crazy landscape. There's no other way of seeing it. I mean, you can do it on bikes or something like that, but there is no tarmac road within it. So, yeah, well, that's sort of the end of the trip. We are now going to make our way back to Bilbao. And during that section, I would just explain my top tips for if you're coming to Spain and some thoughts on this car having now done 11, 1200 kilometers in it. Anyway, I'm gonna reverse up there because there's tarmac up there and go out and head up and find some better roads. Great to see that area, but yeah, trying to summarise our few days over Spain just from a travel point of view as quickly as I can. Well, one, I've really enjoyed it, and the overriding factor I keep coming back to is it's vast, it's open, it's well tarmacked, but it's empty. And the, especially as we headed south, I have to say that first day going down to Ubeda, that was extraordinary I just couldn't believe our luck and yet it's carried on each day as it's gone by this last day just this area around this park perhaps the roads are a little bit busier but that's as we head north and that's what I've always found with Spain that northern coast and into the Pyrenees is generally a bit busier especially out to the northern coast the Pyrenees not so bad and the slight downside if you do plan routes around the Pyrenees you are fighting for road space with a lot of cyclists quite often especially at weekends but I think yeah, my favourite area is probably around I think it was Kudos or something I'll put it up I'll put a map section we went through a gorge with more testing roads um, but you can't really go wrong because you were actually celebrating the empty roads and that it feels like France in the 70s or something and then you stumble across these little uh, towns and villages that you can stop off uh, for a coffee or whatever. 
has also been great after two years of travel restrictions to finally get away and not have to do the advanced passenger forms, not to have the um, sort of test in advance of travel. And your speeds tend to be fairly high just because of the open road and the emptiness, especially the first day that you're in a state of shock if you've just driven from the UK. And then you sort of mellow and didn't just enjoy it. But just, yeah, police-wise, very little activity actually. Just going to overtake a couple of trucks. There's one. Oh, and the boost comes in. There we are. It's just extraordinary. It's cut off for that job. Um, yes. So a couple of stops with the police just coming out of it. Is, uh, they just want to check documents and that sort of thing speed cameras on their motorway systems very well marked 120 km hour limits on the motorway but generally you sort of lot up along and the locals are all going that little bit quicker as well and you do do a lot of distance the shock i suppose but never seen another sort of sports car of any description i'm photographed one once have a look at Porsche, I saw a Panamera on the motorway and the Macan, that's it. No convertibles, no Jaguar F-types, no nothing. Z3, Z4s, absolutely no sports car. A couple of hot hatches is about it really. I saw a, a Renault R26. So yeah, really surprising with these incredible roads that they haven't actually got that sort of car culture. So I think that's the one advantage perhaps Italy has got over Spain is the car culture. You've got the Ferraris, you've got the museums, all sorts of areas to visit which related to cars. That's less easy to do in Spain, but the plus side are the empty roads, the vistas, the, the scenery, everything's just as good. But And I like the way if you come by ferry, you're straight into the action. You can't get a ferry to Italy, you have to get across France first. So yeah, that's my summary on the sort of travel side of things. Turning to the car, well Porsche 930, we just do some of the, the sort of 911-ness of it. They're very malleable car, uh, the 911. There's more space, you've got that front area, but you've got this massive bonus having the rear seat area which you can fold down. So you you can carry more in the car than you might expect. Other little things I love, if I just do this, the sunroof, I love the way the sunroof actually opens there. When I look up, I look at sky and it, there is no sort of buffeting for it whatsoever. I'm going to close it again. So I use that quite a lot. Just when you're coming into town or something like that, then you do, or you just want to cool the car down. They're little as well, so you, you can sort of fit them places. And if you've got, you're traveling somewhere where there's sort of medieval towns and they've got little tiny streets, it's very handy being in a 911 and so there's some enormous, super wide supercar. So I like all that as well. Now, turn into this car, this 930 Turbo S. What have I learned on this trip? Well, on, it's a great GT. Let's go through some of the positives. I can't get over how relaxing it is at speed. There is much less wind noise than you'd expect for a car of this age. A cruise at motorway speeds is just on a whiff of throttle. The downside though was that fuel consumption and it hasn't got any better and I've checked with a few people and that is what happens if you've got a highly tuned 930 engine they absolutely drink fuel and 12 mpg 13 mpg is about it we have seen readings of down to 10 mpg and that's a pain not only from a budget point of view just from range we're having to fill up at 280 kilometers and then you're looking for a petrol stop which is under 200 miles and you really want to range over 200 miles when you're cruising on long distance but that's where the performance comes from they run them extra rich to uh, get me cool the tops of pistons it's something you do and i borrowed that Bugatti Chiron from and they have equally bad fuel consumption so it's a 930 or a uh, Bugatti Chiron is the same weirdly 
the Kuntash is better, 16, 17 mpg, but the paragon of the three supercars I own is the Ferrari Testarossa that will do 20 mpg plus on a motorway cruise, almost twice as good on fuel as this Porsche 930. Who would have believed that? Other things I loved about it, the turbo push, God is addictive, and I've got so many clips of sort of overtakes. You, you come across a truck into third, hits boost, what a, there is no other car that can overtake like this one. Really enjoyable. And I like it's sort of the taller tires and things, the sort of comfort through the you know testing corners. It doesn't feel as sharp on the steering as a modern car. That's what we get from those super low profile tires. With these taller tires, there's a different sort of feel of the steering, but steering feel is epic. It's always just talking, it's just rolling as you go around the corners, always some chatter coming through the wheel. And I'll absolutely love that. Brakes have been tested on this um, trip and I'm gonna have to fit new discs. It had a little bit of judder before I came out and it's much worse now. So I've really enjoyed this trip. I hope you've enjoyed joining us on this trip around Spain. We're heading to Bilbao now and then there's this exhibition that I'm going to have a quick look at while we're there, which has been curated by Norman Foster, etc. It's got some epic cars. But for now, though, I'm just going to enjoy the final bits of these empty, deserted, wonderful roads, the 70 degree heat, and the turbo boost for a little bit longer. But I hope you enjoyed the video. Have, keep watching, keep subscribing, more videos coming along very soon. Thanks for watching.